I lived in a town where disco never really became popular, so this kind of came and went without me being aware. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hello, this is George the Antique Nomad, and this is part two of the tour of Vintage Modern St. Pete. This is such a great mall, and I can't wait to show you more. Vintage Modern St. Pete is in the 2500 block of Central Avenue, which has become the antique district in this part of town, in the Grand Central District. Next door is Lion's Paw, which is a great shop with everything from modernism and jewelry to military. Next to that is Refound, and she is an antique jewelry specialist. Antique and vintage and estate jewelry, both costume and fine. She's got great stuff, as well as French market-style painted furniture. Next door is Queen's Head, which is a great restaurant. And then on the other side of the street is Buster's. And Buster's has furniture. They are an Annie Sloan chalk paint specialist and they also do lighting as you can see in the window there. So it's a really neat area for collectors to discover and we're gonna to walk towards the front here so that you can get an idea of what it's like from the outside. It's a nice sunny warm day of course. <clears throat> One great thing is that as we look at this really cool chrome center table and the lucite and chrome chairs in this window one great thing about St. Pete is it's in the off season. So right now, and here's my reflection, I do. Right now is a great time to come because social distancing is not a problem and things are open and stocked and ready to go. This is Sunny. Sunny was hatched right here. There was originally a breeding pair who lived in the mall. They thought that they were both boys, but turned out one of them was a girl and Sunny was the result. So that happy pair moved away to an aviary where there's still a breeding pair, but Sunny is never known anywhere but here. Yes, I would take you out and let you ride with me, but I have to videotape. She loves being out though, and she loves visitors, so come and say hi. I remember working in an antique mall when I was first in the business, and one of the women said, if I ever see a velvet painting of Elvis come into this antique mall, I'll know it's time for me to quit. Well, you know what? <laughs> Here is a velvet painting of Elvis in an antique mall, and they are very desirable. This one's priced at $125, and someone actually put a hold on it last week. And, you know, Elvis lives. He is the king. This will date from the 1970s, and this is a nice large size one. And it's Elvis, and he's crying, so it's, it's pretty much everything. I wanted to show this three-piece sofa set. This is Paul Frankel, and Frankel was a designer in America who started doing rattan as part of his Art Deco designs around 1938. It set off a real mania for this type of furniture. His can be distinguished by the wide banding. You see there's six rows and the shaping is very modernist. Very desirable. This set should sell for around a thousand. And next to it is the matching bar. I used to have a rattan tiki bar just like this. Big curved affair from the 1940s or 50s. They're just beautiful. They're really great. I miss mine very much but I really couldn't get it into my new house because the corner was too tight to get around and mine was about two feet longer. This lamp with the prisons and the gold is absolutely Hollywood Regency from the 1960s and priced at, let's take a look here, $195 is the price on that. And for one with so many prisms, you know, if you figure that the prisms are about $5 a piece, well, there's the whole value of the lamp right there. Shell art is very collectible, particularly when you get older pieces. The box in the back here is signed Bremerhaven, which means it was sold in Germany. A lot of these were made to be sold in Europe as tourist attractions. You see on the right, the one with the steamship, which would have been sold on board the steamship. And then the little shoe in front, I believe, holds uh, sewing implements. These are all going to date from before the Second World War, and that's the original era that you see this sort of thing. 
and the prices reflected, you're going to see prices for older pieces like this anywhere from about $50 to $100. Now after the war, it starts to be taken up overseas, and you see shell pieces like these encrusted salt and pepper shakers, which are priced at about $10. Usually when we see a glass hanging lamp like this these days, those are lucite bars, but this one is all glass. These were made in Italy, and these are what the lucite ones were patterned from. So this is a little earlier, probably late 60s, and priced because it's Murano glass in the high hundreds. Next to it we have the classic Turner Flamingo print. This one has been reframed probably in the 1980s, but Turner was a company out of Chicago in the 50s who did these sorts of pieces because originally they made mirrors and they used these as cutout inserts for the mirrors and they were so popular that then they became printmakers. This one's priced at 95 which is lower than they usually go. There are a couple of dealers in this mall that deal in Christmas all year round. So it can be Christmas in July on a 95 degree day in Florida, but they've got a great selection here. You'll see things priced from $5 to $50 depending on age and desirability for the ornaments. Down below is a nice box of shiny brights, but I really wanted to zero in on this paper mache faced Santa. He's thin, which is a different style. We're used to heavy duty fat Santas in this country, but he originally started out as a thin guy. And this one is priced from Germany at about 135 A little more Santa wear. These are mainly 1950s and 60s ceramics. Most of these would have been made in Japan. Among the most popular now are the Spaghetti Santa on the left, priced at 35 And in the middle here, on the train, is a Holt Howard Santa. When Holt Howard started in the mid-50s, Christmas and seasonal holiday wear were all they made. And their designs were so cute that they got the attraction of J.C. Penney's and other major department stores, and all of a sudden they were demanding other things to make year-round, and that's when you see Cozy Kitties, the Pixie Wear, and some of those other famous lines come along. I mentioned that Holt Howard got started in Christmas, and this Santa Says How Strong Are You carnival-type strength bell is an unusual Christmas decoration, and it's Holt Howard, an early piece. The two to the right are a form, they're really like a paper mache, and those were very popular in the late 60s and early 70s, mainly made in Japan, but they have a nice look and are also collected. Price on the Holt Howard piece is 28, and the others are around 15 apiece. And not only do I have to show you this one, but I think I have to buy this one. This is Treasure Craft. Treasure Craft had a Christmas line for one year. I believe it was 1953. It was very short-lived. It's very hard to find anything with the Santas, because right after this is when the Japanese start importing lots of really inexpensive little figures, and Treasure Craft decided to start making the big brown dancers and get out of the little pieces because they couldn't compete. The other thing that's nice about this is it's got the Treasure Craft paper label, which is often missing on these. The red shade on this is what makes this Lucite lamp unusual. The base is Lucite, as we see. Getting in a little closer, I think you get the gist of it. It is a column base. And then the red shade is an unusual color in fiberglass. And when we say fiberglass, you can tell a little bit more when you look on the inside that it is indeed some sort of a spun product like that. This one has all its original stitching and is in really nice shape and is priced at $179. But dealers here typically are very good about negotiating. And if you see something in this video, you can certainly contact Vintage Modern St. Pete. Now floral patterns are not something we necessarily equate with modernism because so many were done around the turn of the century, but these large florals were popular in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and this particular set is Blue Ridge Pottery out of Tennessee. It's nice to see a whole set all together. We generally see people having to collect these a piece at a time. Well, the big joke in England when they broke up was that they would sell commemorative plates that were broken in half with one on each side, but the English love royalty commemoratives. And yes, there actually is a very obscure and hard to find divorce plate. This one, of course, is from 1981 when they were first married, and we have 
Prince Charles on the left and Lady Di on the right at a very young and innocent age. Roosters were everywhere in the 1950s and 60s. <laughs> I just get a kick out of this. Pretzels, chips, and peanuts, and you can just get them by the shovelful, apparently. Funny thing about this is that it can't really hold them because they would spill out the front, so I guess you were just supposed to eat them that way. This is going to date to about 1970. He's only got a price $5. I think I might just have to take this because anything with a rooster from that era is good stuff for kitchens. And I know a lot of collectors are discovering Hager. This is in a half-off booth. They have to get it. This is the mother and child. And you can see the sticker on the bottom. Hager started using paper labels in the 1980s and 90s as opposed to the embossed stamps that they had done before. But it's still talking about being American-made. That was a big deal during the early 90s. The whole idea of sending all of our production overseas was very controversial, and a lot of companies really pushed by American and their American heritage. Unfortunately, they are mostly gone now. I wanted to show these stems because I have always... Boy, one thing you will notice in antique stores, because everything's been shut for two months, that things have a little bit of extra dust. But uh, I have always really liked these. These are 1970s. They're by Arco Rock. I'm used to seeing them in Canada. They weren't distributed as much in the United States. Arco Rock is a French maker of glass. These are the arches. And what's great about the arches is you've got this great modernist design where it's a traditional stem, but then you've got these clear panels, which really gives it a different look. And they look really cool when you put beverages in them. If you put wine in, you see the color. If you put some sort of a cordial or cocktail in, you see the color through the arches. And then the little stems are for sherbets. They are asking $55 for all of this, which is a total of 12 pieces. That's only about $4 a piece. And they typically sell for between 6 and 10 depending on the stem. They do a lot of outdoor pieces here as well. And this monumental statue, which is taller than I am, she must be at least 6 foot 6, is just a fantastic garden statue. This came out of a manor close to the waterfront here in St. Pete. Looking at the base and the way she's made and the type of wear, I would guess that this was probably installed originally about 60 or 70 years ago. She's just fantastic. I was here one day and a couple from Washington, D.C. were really interested in her. She was priced about a thousand. It was a good price for what she was, but then they couldn't figure out how to get her home. So she's waiting for someone to love her. In the back, we have a longtime experienced pair of antique dealers who really specialize in modernism, and they have a really nice display here. Lots of stuff where you can just sort of picture what it would look like in your home. It's a chance to sort of take a step back and breathe. If you don't like lots of little things, this might be more your speed. The hanging lamp from the mid-1960s. It's been restored. It's priced about $2.95. Danish modern chairs. They are really comfortable to sit in. They really thought about the ergonomics and they're padded in the right places. These have the original upholstery. These should date also to the 1970s. And let's see what the price on the set is. They're stamp made in Denmark. I've had this set before. I not been able to discern who the designer is. The set of four is priced under 400, which for Danish modern, not a bad price these days. This is a really fantastic piece of Lane Brutalist modern. This is the Pueblo design. What's interesting about this is it mixes brutalism with the geometry of the Pueblos and some of the coloration. So you actually get a little bit of stain variation here. You'll see some ruddy stains to bring out aspects of the design. I'm going to open this door to see how smoothly it runs. They made a lot of the cedar chests that you see. That was their big stock and trade for many years. But then in the 60s, they really went into modernism. This chest of drawers is rosewood. And rosewood is a premium in the marketplace because it's a very good quality wood with a very distinctive grain. It takes the finish in a specific way. And rosewood is not really available anymore. From the construction, this appears to be Janish. Some of the hallmarks of that are you can see the way that the drawer slides are made to fit in a notch so that the drawers don't bounce around. That's a hallmark of Danish construction. 
also the fact that the plywood inserts are not press board or particle board. They are indeed solid. You see a lot of press board and particle wood in Thai teak furniture, which was imported as a knockoff of this sort of thing. But this is rosewood and likely Danish. Priced about a thousand. These are Balinese and they are polychrome. These are original to, in all likelihood, the late 19th or early 20th century. And I'll pan down so that you can get a better look at them. The hands are held in the correct manner. The hands are also not broken. Anything that projects on these sorts of things tended to be lost or broken. And so these are pretty phenomenal for their condition. They have the correct wear, but they still have their feet, which means they could be stood as well as hanging on a wall. You might not necessarily think of this sort of thing as being part of modern decor, but collecting from other cultures really became a thing in the United States in the 1960s. A lot of people had traveled because of the Second World War and got the international travel bug, and jet travel becomes possible, so suddenly people are going places they've never been before, and they're bringing pieces like this back to put in their modernist decor, and modern collectors today do the same thing. This is a nice Killeen carpet. It's priced at $8.95. It's been cleaned which is very helpful because it costs a lot to have these clean. So when you take that into account, it's a pretty good price considering it would cover an entire floor. And the clean design is very distinctive. It's a good alternative for a lot of people who like the general look of this, but don't want something with such a strong oriental carpet appeal. I have found over the years that when you see this particular swoop in a chair where it's longer and more exaggerated, where the arms taper into the back, it almost always seems to be an Adrian Pearsall design. And in fact, this is an Adrian Pearsall design, even though that doesn't have its original tag anymore. Adrian Pearsall was a designer who was probably at his zenith in the 1960s. If you look at early episodes of Bewitched, you'll see in the black and white years that they had designs that appear to be Pearsall as part of their set. This one is priced at $7.95. I have to say most of the chairs of his that I've seen have been priced in that range, and they do seem to sell. Behind we have a nice teak credenza, also Danish. Really thoughtful about the ergonomics. Look how you can just hold that with two fingers and easily slide it open and shut, or even just one. Quality really had a lot to do with the popularity of Danish furniture, and another thing that lent to its popularity was that the Danes had a big pavilion at the 1962 Seattle World's Fair full of Danish furniture, and it really caught on. Do you think modern when you see McCoy? Usually I don't, but when I see this piece I do, and so did this dealer, and I think they got it right. These are priced about 58 each, it appears, and they've even got larger ones at the same price. That's a pretty good deal. These usually, in the larger size, I've seen sell for as much as 85 to 100. They are McCoy from about 1940, and it's a really interesting quilted pattern with the leaves. So you get that McCoy look, but it gives it more of a modern flair. These are 1930s Japanese, the cream and sugar elephants. I just think they're as cute as can be. Look at that bright painting. It went along with Japanese lusterware, although they're not specifically luster. We have the Fire King Jadeite swirled nesting mixing bowls, and they have all four sizes. One of these sizes, and I believe it's the small one, is much harder to find than the other three, and that's why this set is priced at 145. Another jadeite piece people don't see often is this beaded bowl. Now there's lots of reproductions in jadeite, but this is not one of them. Even though it doesn't say Fire King, not all of the pieces said Fire King, especially early in the production, and this is an earlier production piece. They have that priced at 35. Here's another set of Blue Ridge pottery. This one is priced at $195 for the whole set in the apple pattern, one of the most popular patterns they made. This is a good example of everybody can't know everything. This is a very experienced dealer, but they've put a very inexpensive price on this piece of Louis Glass. Louis Glass was a company that produced in the Depression, and this particular undulating pitcher with the ice lip, this is to hold the ice in so it doesn't fall into your glass, 
and it has the reeded handle. This is probably their most famous and most popular piece. They only have this priced at $29, so I'm going to look into it. It might come home with me. And of course, Vintage Kitchen is part of a modern lifestyle, and here's some really fun pieces. I especially like these two Swing Away Ice Crutchers. I've always liked the Swing Away line. These were all plastic, and then the top is metal. But this one is plastic and plastic because these are going to be from the 1960s or 70s when they took their original metal design and made it in plastic to make it ship more easily and because they could make bright happy colors that way. They're only $24 each and they're pretty useful on a hot summer day. I've always liked this happy set of fruit tumblers. These are called zombie glasses because the zombie drink became very popular and they have fun fruit graphics on them. It's nice that they're satin glass too because that way you have a way to use them in a place like Florida where there's a lot of phosphate in the water without them immediately chalking. And the price on this set, which is a set of eight, so it's the complete set, is only $48, so $6 per glass. Late 50s, early 60s when screen print glassware was really at its zenith. And then if you want your dinner to fly to outer space, you could cook it in this. This is the Century Futurmatic Automatic Cooking Skillet. We'll show that. I think it says it. Yes, there it says. And then you can turn the dial to whatever temperature and it'll tell you what you're fricasseeing. This was considered such an iconic kitchenware piece from the late 50s that it ended up on the cover of one of the 50s kitchenware collector books back in the 1990s. I'm always fond of telling people if you're in a store and you say, well, gee, they have nice things, but they're all retail, look for the thing that doesn't seem like it fits. This Fenton Peacock vase is indeed from the modern era. These were made about 1970 in the green custard glass. It does have the Fenton label, which is embossed. The logo is starting to appear on Fenton about this time, although I don't know that you'll be able to see it in this camera view because it's very faint. That's why they were still using paper labels at this time. This glows green as can be under a black light. At $29, it's a great deal. I remember as a kid that all of a sudden there was this TV special on and the Bee Gees were on it and they were talking about this movie that was going to come out and making a really big deal out of it. And well, that movie was Saturday Night Fever and pretty soon the Bee Gees had gone from an Australian pop band that had had a few hits in the late 60s and early 70s that were nothing like their disco era to being the disco band of the season. And this is from 1979 at the peak of their popularity and it is a portable record and there you've got Barry Maurice and Robin Gibb on stage and you even have Jive Talkin' which was probably their first disco oriented single which I think came out in 75. So this is kind of fun. I have not seen this before I lived in a town where disco never really became popular, so this kind of came and went without me being aware of it other than that television show. I remember they had Waylon Flowers and Madam as the host, and that was entertaining for sure, so uh, I watched it, but I didn't see the movie until years later. We'll be right back with more of this video. If you're enjoying it, please hit thumbs up to like it. Hit subscribe below if you haven't already subscribed to the channel and hit the bell to be notified of new videos. I do a new video every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, plus bonus videos. And if you comment, if you subscribe, if you like, it really helps us and it doesn't cost you anything. So thank you for that, and now back to the video. These tables should definitely be shown. This is another design by Lane. These are called Lane laminates, and laminates meant that they use lamination, like you think of with laminate flooring to do these tables and other furniture that had these designs that were at once both modernist and traditional because this is actually based on dovetailing. Take a look and you'll see what I mean. It really does look like dovetails inside of a drawer, but when you use it on the surface in a contrasting wood, suddenly you have a very modernist design. They made some really cool pieces. They had a surfboard shaped and a kidney shaped coffee table as well. You see these rectangular end tables somewhat more frequently. These have been restored. They're in really wonderful condition and it's a great look for modernist decor. And here we have the matching tiered tables. I personally have always liked tiered tables because why not have more display space and a higher lamp table base 
in the same amount of space that you're going to take for a piece of furniture anyway. Now this stretches the bounds of modernism, but what a pretty piece this is. This is a lithograph from the Spanish-American War with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. One of the reasons you'll see this here, it's priced at 95. I think that's a pretty good price. You can see Mr. Roosevelt there on his horse, the trademark mustache and spectacles. One of the reasons you see this here is because the Spanish-American War played heavily in Tampa Bay's early development. Tampa was the point of embarkation for Cuba and the war because Miami barely even existed. It had just barely been founded in the middle of an orange grove, so it was a tiny little town. Tampa had boomed to be a town of about 10,000 because of the war, and a lot of the war veterans settled here afterwards, and that was the beginning of real settlement in St. Petersburg. The little lake I live near, Mirror Lake in St. Pete, had to be guarded by the U.S. military for the two years of the Spanish War. They had an encampment around Mirror Lake because it was the city's water source. It was also where they filled the ships going to Cuba, and the Spanish tried to send people over to poison the lake, so they guarded it for the next two years. St. Pete has really become an art town. And so vintage modern art is selling well as well as new art. There are several stores. The Florida Craftsman store is one of them here that are very well regarded. On the right, this abstract oil on canvas is from 1965, signed A.M. Impasto. I don't know if that's a listed artist. The piece is done with a palette knife. It's priced at 125. Next to it, this modernist piece with the human figure has a Picasso-esque feel to it, but was by an artist named Yang Lin, who was originally from China. This was done in 1994. A lot of times something that just looks like a box turns out to be a humidor. This one makes it pretty obvious because it's got its original 1890s banknote five cent cigar label on it. That's going to make it pretty valuable as an advertising piece, I suspect. It's in American oak, and there is the metal liner. And it is priced at $195, which again doesn't surprise me because this crosses into a lot of different collecting categories, and boxes are popular in general right now. And cigar smoking actually took an uptick in the late 1990s during the President Clinton issue. The tulip table is a modernist classic. If you remember the old Mary Tyler Moore show, her first apartment had this tulip table prominently displayed. They were very popular in 1970 when that show came out, and this one's great because it's got the chrome chairs with the padding that are a good match for it. On top of it is a whole bunch of really beautiful orange swung glass. All of these pieces are going to be by Viking Fenton or Ellie Smith. Uh, or the Fayette Glass Division of L.E. Smith. It would take a while to go through and tell you which is which, but generally speaking, if you see these kind of lobes, that's a Viking piece, or this type of a foot. If you see hobnails, if they're pointed, like the ones in the back here, these are Fenton. If they're not, then there's a good chance that they're the Kanawha Company out of West Virginia. These solid creamsicle colored ones often have this label that says handmade Fayette glass. Fayette was part of Ellie Smith. In any event, collectors often don't care. They just love the stuff and they mix and match and it's so much fun. I mean, just look how hot that is. What a great graphic this is on this turn of the century Chronicle board game by Milton Bradley. Collectors of games of this era generally are really looking for the graphics, so the fact that this box is in great shape is the reason that it's priced at 95 It really is all about the look. Anything Disney does well here because we're near Orlando, and usually that's a big tourist attraction because, well, it's a small world after all. And so we have Bambi with the butterfly on the tail. It's priced at 65 These used to go for double that. They are fragile. They were easy to knock over. There's really not so many around, so that seems like a pretty good price to me. Next to it, the condiment set with the three ladies. That's a salt and pepper, and then you have the centerpiece, which is a jam jar with spoon. 
probably made in Japan about the time they were making half dolls. It was another way to use that mold and extend the line, and they're very cute, and only $24 for that set. Machinist chests have become very collectible. People are using them for all sorts of things. Women have discovered that they have great utility for jewelry and small collections, so it's not just for guys with tools anymore. This one's in really neat condition because it's got the original mirror fully intact. I think I'm in there somewhere. Hello there. I took up my mask so I could talk because there's nobody in this part of the store right now. I have it at the ready if needed. The best part about these is you take this off, which you can only do when you open it so it won't fall out on you. And when you take it off, you have all these great little drawers for any number of items. This particular one has the original Iron Products Company label on it, which makes it even just a little bit nicer. Even the Metal Kennedy boxes from about 1950 sell in the $100 range now, so these have become very interesting to people again. Next to it we have a ship's lantern. Of course we're near the coast and anything to do with nautical becomes popular when you're near the coast. This one is priced at $175. For its size, that's probably about the right price. Now again, this might not seem like a modernist thing, but it does go with industrial style, and a lot of people are decorating industrial these days. This is a wine press, and it's got the pressing plates and the paddle. It has everything it needs to work. It should date to about 1900. You can tell by the weightiness of the casting and how heavy it is on the turning wheel. And it's priced at $4.95. Honestly, a new press costs in that vicinity. And this one would work. So if you would rather have old, which is how I feel about most things, that's a nice alternative. And then there's some early 1900s Mission Oak and Tiger Oak pieces that are of a more plain aspect. That really is the beginning of American modernism. Here we see a stacking lawyer's bookcase, otherwise known as a barrister's bookcase. This is a two stacker priced at $3.95, so that's about $200 per level with the base and the top included. That is about what these sell for retail now, around $200 per level if they're in good condition and have the foundation and the top. Next to this, this is not a modernist item, of course, but it's a very pretty reverse painted mirror, and this is going to be early 19th century federal. The detail in the painting is really good, and that's why they went ahead and had this piece stabilized. It does have a crack. People ask me if cracks can be repaired. They can't really be repaired, but they can be stabilized so that they won't grow or so that the piece will not fall apart. And that's what the dealer has done with this one. And they have it on sale for $145. If you can live with the condition, which otherwise is very good, I think it's a beautiful piece. Now we're out on the back porch, and everything in the back porch is for sale, too. The store was closed for a couple of months, so forgive the weeds. That's on the list of things to do. Everything's only been open for a very short time here. But really great architectural and pottery pieces and good patio furniture. The windmills are great. They're maybe 9 or 10 feet tall. They probably would actually pump water if you hooked them up. Most people just have it as decoration. You have the two very grand garden statues, one holding the vessel and one holding the flower basket. These are really fun, these high stools with the metalwork. These would be 1960s or 70s. I don't really see tall ones like this often. And then these little chairs are redwood folding chairs. They are $59 for the pair. That's a pretty good price. In California and the West Coast, these sell for a lot more, but I don't know that people on the East Coast really recognize them. They're from the 1960s. And then more metal furniture. You'll see floral patterns. There were various makers. Saltarini is one that's well known. Edward Woodard was another designer that's well regarded. Behind it, and again, they need a little bit of cleaning. This is kind of the next place to work on now that things are open again. But this chaise lounge and the other chaise lounge here are from about 1970, and they're made of these fiberglass strands, which are woven. And you'll see tables in this. They have a very distinct style, and it's amazing how these little strands that were 
in and of themselves not really strong together make an incredibly strong piece of furniture. When you have the tables, you can stand right on top of them and it can hold the weight of a grown man. We're going to see back in here that they also did bar furniture in that style. So if you have an outdoor tiki bar, there's a neat three-piece set back there priced at $5.75 for the stools with the bar. And then in front, just for fun, we have the world's largest cat. Everyone thinks cats are cute. Well, this one is cute and big and I would not want to have a cat that size. But maybe in my yard it would be alright. And then behind there are two vintage lawn jockeys. These are controversial now, but they're actually based on a pretty famous black man who was George Washington's horseman. And that was where the design came from. These originally were wired up to hold lanterns. Nowadays people typically who have these are black Americana collectors. You don't see them just sitting out in people's yards anymore because, you know, they're exaggerated. And not everybody thought that was really great. And with so much interest in Jadeite and Fire King and Pyrex, there is a dealer who does nothing but vintage kitchen. And I hope these pictures come out because it's kind of dark back here. But boy, they have cool stuff. A lot of kitchen queens and they are for sale as well. Here we've got the Westinghouse by Hall China jars. Hall China and Homer Lachlan are united now, but Hall is mostly known for teapots. However, in the 1930s and 40s, you could buy a refrigerator that had Hall China refrigerator dishes in it made exclusively for Westinghouse. They're pretty collectible. They sell for about $25 a piece in this size. And they're pretty handy uh, because it's Hall China. You could even take it out of the fridge and put it right in the microwave. These are McCoy with the pink banded. This was a popular pattern in the 30s and then it was reissued in the 70s, which is when these pieces are from. The big soup tureens are only in the $35 to $40 range. A lot of neat fired on patterns here. The apple pattern on the left is typically seen in Canada, not so much in the United States. And then on the right we have the Dutch children and then the Vitrock set with the Art Deco tulip pots. Well, tulips, they're stylized flowers of some sort anyway. This one is Black Snowflake by Pyrex. That is harder to find. That one's priced at 59 in the Cinderella shape. And then a really clean Lustroware set of rectangular plastic fantastic kitchen canisters from the 1950s. We used to see these inexpensively at estate sales and now, boy, you can't find them in good condition to save your life. So it's nice to see a whole set. And of course I had to bring in the fabulous owl lamp. You may have seen in my video where I found this at Mount Dora and one of them sold right away and this one I just finally got the shade repaired and here it is. Just love that piece. This is a 1978 Airtay print. The 70s were when Art Deco started to be really popular to collect. It had been about 40 years and there was a lot of interest in that era and the designs were just so wonderful and streamlined and it led to a big revival of deco type modernism revival designs in the 1980s. Erte was a fashion designer in France in the 1930s and he was rediscovered shortly before his death and a lot of additions were done because he had displays in museums suddenly popping up all over, including in Grosvenor Gallery in London, where this print came from, and then was licensed to Mirage Editions. You'll see Mirage Editions on a lot of poster prints from this era. Mirage in and of itself isn't what the people collect, but they had a good eye for who was going to be collectible, so you'll see their name on a lot of poster prints of items that did indeed end up becoming desirable in the marketplace. In the middle, the maple leaves are a Curtis Jurey. Jurey was actually two people, a guy named Jerry and a guy named Curtis, who decided Curtis Jurey sounded like a wonderful name for a company. They had originally been in business making copper jewelry under the Renoir and Matisse lines in the 1950s and early 60s, 
And then they realized that they could use that same working in copper and metal craft to make these large wall pieces. And that's when Jure was born. Most Jure pieces are signed in a corner in a very small place. And in this case, this one signed and dated 1982, right on the leaf. Another Disney item, this lobby poster, this is smaller than a one sheet. So this would have been for a small theater but this is for Walt Disney's Jungle Cat in Technicolor. Disney did a lot of animal movies. They worked a lot with the Olympic Game Farm in Squim, Washington, and that's where a lot of these wild animals were kept and trained so that they could be used in Disney movies. Next to it, you have a green stacked lamp. If you weren't a fan of the chrome one in my space, well, my neighbor has this one in a really great designer color. A couple of things I wanted to show in my space. The white lamp here is a Lytolier, and these floor lamps with the cones are starting to be pretty collectible. I've seen them selling as much as two and a quarter, and I think I have 175 or 200 on mine. The other piece is the office chair. I sold one just like this here for $60 right before the hiatus, and they are Popular again because lots of people are working at home and they're adjustable, they have good back support, and if they have four legs like this one does, then they're stable. I would avoid the ones with three legs. I've had a few tips and falls on those. This chest of drawers is Norman Bel Geddes. They do get designer furniture here. This is a 1930s or early 40s piece. The colors are really fun. They did various colors. I've seen them in very bright yellows. They tended to be pastel-y happy colors, and this one I believe is priced at $3.95. And on top is a yard okay. long of Lummis Park Beach in the Miami Beach, Florida, where right the right Park there. Central right and there. the Beacon yeah. Hotel are. This yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah, sure. I think it's really neat for two twenty-five. dollars Hard to find. There's also a lot of good costume jewelry and fun costume jewelry here. Look at all the butterflies. Butterfly pins were really big in the 1960s. I remember my grandmother had a bunch of them. They're very popular with younger women now, and it's spring. Some of those are going to be designer names, and some of them are just nice colored crystals. Prices seem to be in the $30 to $40 range. And some fun boudoir pieces to the right of the flag. You've got a nice little deco compact with the rhinestones down the middle, and then the guilloche compact with the heliotrope. 1920s piece that is going to be priced at $65, which is really a very fair price for guilloche. It's got the basket hat and the flowers painted in it. Next to it is a full doll. I mean, she's a half doll, but she's actually a full standing figure and she's been made into a brush. And you see another one made into a brush to the right in the pink. She's a half doll. Those are 1920s with the flapper designs, and those are a lot of fun, again, in the $50 to $75 range. Mermaids are very collectible now. The Norcrest on the fish is priced at $95. The prices have just really gone up. So many people collecting mermaids now. These little gals are in the $25 to $65 range. Really fun and lucite purses. It would not be Florida without vintage designer sunglasses and lucite purses. The butterscotch to the left is priced at $195. The one in the middle is just amazing and very hard to find with all the rhinestones intact. And that one's priced over a thousand, but you know what? They retail at that because they're so hard to find without damage. Some Lucite purses run in the hundred and a quarter, hundred thirty-five range, and they typically go up from there. There were a lot of different makers. Some were here in Florida. It started in New York, but the New Yorkers would bring them down, and it became all the rage in the winters in Florida. This one's fun because it has shells and rhinestones encrusted. And Enid Collins as well, this box purse with fauna from Enid Collins is a 1960s, late 60s, early 70s design. She also became known as Collins of Texas. You'll see the EC in the lower right corner. And later years, they would have been a horse in that design as well as part of their logo.
then below that we have a magazine purse. This is fun. This is an extension of the designs that came out of Italy in the late 60s where they made the purses look like magazines to try to keep the pickpockets from stealing them. Then the English thought it was fun to just make purses that looked like newspaper and they did them in regular typical handbag styles rather than the little rolled magazine style. More lucite purses, ostrich skin. There's an Edwardian alligator purse here. That's quite a bit older than we usually see. You can tell by the hardware on that, that that's an earlier piece. And then fun spotted fur hats made to look like leopard. There's also a large selection of Swarovski crystal animals priced starting at $35. The quality is just so good in Swarovski, and the way they glisten, it's pretty amazing. One last thing I should show you is this really great pair of lamps. These with the double layer shades are probably by the Majestic Company. Majestic Lamps typically did these very fanciful 1950s designs. These happen to have the floral look to them, and they have little lights in the bottom as well as the really great double shade. Hard to find mash pairs of these anymore, particularly the dancers where there's a male and female figure. Those can go for hundreds now. Thanks for joining me here at the Antique Nomad. I'm on the Periscope, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with daily posts on social media and weekly videos here on YouTube. It's so great to have you with us and thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at the Antique Nomad. Bye for now!